God is good all the time. Hallelujah. All the time. Praise Jesus. Thank you, Bishop, brother. Bless you from St. Croix and everyone there and all the saints in between. We get to heaven. We'll spend a couple of 10,000 years and catch up together and see how we do. <laughs> okay. So I'm standing behind the desk in front of you all again. Bless you. Praise you, Michael. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. Um, I'm tired of you, too. Uh, no. <laughs> So I do things a little different around here. You just have to get used to it. Most of you are getting to know me. I'm so grateful. This is why they only let me come up here once in a while or it would just become complete havoc. <laughs> We're in James chapter 1. We already learned about how to count it all joy. We already knew that from the very beginning he was writing to the 12 tribes of Israel. So there goes squashing the 10 tribes got tossed and only the two good ones got remained. So we throw that old hack out the window, and whenever that comes up, you'll, you'll know that that's not really the case. We talked about if anybody lacks wisdom, right? Knowledge is what you know. Wisdom is what you do with it. Understanding is what comes only over the passage of time. The word understanding could be the word like maturity. Saw that coming a mile away. Well, you had to have done a few miles before you can have seen it coming a mile away. Right? Right, right, right? So we've been, we've been moving through this, and what we're about to discuss today, James is going to be talking to us a little bit about our faith. And interestingly enough, a lot of us believe we have faith, but could you imagine if you found out that you were using the wrong faith? Could you imagine if you found out that you were trusting in the wrong faith? And when you know the right faith and you choose to do it wrong anyway, well, that's the definition of stupid. Ignorant is a lack of knowledge. You just don't even know you don't even know. Stupid knows better but does the wrong thing anyway. And ignorant keeps doing it over and over and over until they figure sooner or later it's going to change, and it never does. Right? So when we walk through those steps of time, Somewhere along the line, we tend to think we've learned something along the way. Everybody believes you're at an age right now where you are finally smarter than you've ever been in your whole life. And in five more years, you're going to believe you're finally smarter than you've ever been in your whole life, which reminds you that five years ago, you were pretty dumb. <laughs> right? Because you're so much smarter today than you ever were five years ago. Right? So you must have done. Whoever did this... Thank you immensely, but darling, I mean, please stand up for a moment. She did, look, I am blown away to look at this. Look at this beautiful, wow. Gosh, thank you, my sweet darling. I mean, my wife's just pretty as it is, but this is even a, a cherry on top. So <laughs> I get so delighted. I got to tie the bow today, which was really cool. Yeah. You know how they teach bank tellers to recognize counterfeit money? Anybody? Years ago? Today in the modern day, you almost don't have to think anymore. <laughs> you just have to show up. And that's why today we have so many problems. We just can't people get people to show up. So days of old when they were learning to tell tellers, how, you know, bank tellers, teller, they always had tellers. And you know, tellers were always women, right? That's why I never dated any girls who worked at banks. They were always tellers. <laughs> They'd lock him in a room for one day. Yeah, you, some of you got that finally. Yeah. It's, it's okay. I'll say a few more things that by 1 o'clock you'll get it when I'm finished. Um, I appreciate they always give me a little extra time up here just to see if I'll abuse it. Um, so in years of old, um, when they would train a bank teller, and in those days when $500 and $1,000 bills were in circulation, which were normal. Because if you ever lost your wallet, it was really painful then, right? So they'd lock her in a room for a day with a security guard, and she had to bring lunch. There was a bathroom in the room to go behind a private door, but the door still had to be remained ajar open. It was a lady person, of course, to watch this lady 
And she walked in the room, and the tables were just stacked with stacks and stacks of every denomination. And she would spend the entire day apart from her breaks counting all this money. Could you imagine eight hours of fanning through paper money? I mean, you know how many people love money. And we know, and we know it's the love of money, not money. Money's amoral. A means it's neutral. It's neither good nor bad. It's what you do with it and what you allow it to transform you into. This is where the problems come in. So, all day long, she'd be feathering through this money. And the reason why is because money is made out of a fabric, not paper. Money is made of a fabric unlike any other fabric in the world. Money is exclusive to paper. And so, an entire day of fanning through this paper affects your fingertips in such a way that they're never the same again. Ever. So in the old days, part of the training, um, Mr. Brown would come in, and in those days it was all cash, remember? Nobody had checks and debits and all that other stuff. So she would take the bag, unzip it, pull out the whatever, and, hello, Mr. Brown. How was Mrs. Brown? What a lovely day we're having. Yes, and how are the children? Yes, and the dog, good. And then you kind of plan and try and through the whole stack of dough. She wasn't counting the money. The second time, she, no more talking. The first time, she's only feeling the paper. And the reason you talk while you're feeling the paper is because you activate the right brain, the right side of the brain. The left side of the brain, everybody say left side is the logical side. So L for logical. Duh. No, that's not that. Log so the left side of the brain is the logical side of the brain. It's when you're teaching yourself, now pay attention, try your hardest, concentrate. They're going to be depending on you. Who? They're looking at you. Uh. And you're constantly, you ever do that, right? You're talking to yourself. Maybe you're going to play a sport. Maybe you're going to prepare to get up here and embarrass yourself in front of people. I don't know. Whatever you're planning to do, you try to talk yourself through the be careful or get ready or do your best of it. That's activating the left side of your brain. When that happens, your performance will usually flaw. Whatever you're great at will usually not go as well because your left side brain is engaged and it's in the way. The right side of your brain, which is the rudimental side, it's the redundant side, it's the, it's the radical side. It's the ability to sign your autograph, close your eyes, and sign it again, and you probably won't be able to tell the difference. It's some of you, when you were younger, you drove home, and you don't know how you got there. Safe. You remember that Friday night, right? So the deal is the, the lady would just feel this money. Yacking away. And by talking about how is Mrs. Brown and how are the children and how is everything, she's not concentrating on anything, which means she will 100% detect the feeling of false paper. Repeat this after me. In the presence of truth, a lie is always evident. Again, in the presence of truth, a lie is always evident. If your faith is right, you will always recognize false doctrine and what is not true. In the event of false faith, you will be so easily swayed, manipulated, tossed to and fro, become dysfunctional, run for counseling, try this program, do that thing, run for the free credit card, I mean, you become stupid personified. You know better, but choose to do the wrong thing anyway. And nothing, nothing pays a bigger and more deeper price in life 
then the only thing that you could do to yourself that no one can do to you, and you are the only person who can do it, and it's obviously the worst thing that can happen to anyone. Self-deception. Self-deceive. Nothing is more powerful than self-deception. Because when you've deceived yourself, not somebody else, but you did it to you, who's going to fix you? You're convinced of yourself. You're right. So you're willing to fight anybody. You're willing to stand against anyone. You're willing to walk out on a relationship that even matters. Because you are so self-deceived. You are willing to sell out anything to maintain your ego. E-G-O. Everybody say ego. Ego. E-G-O. Easing God out. And the moment you ease God out, hello. Here comes my pride. Here comes my good looks. Here comes my way. Here comes my rights. Here comes I want it. Don't tell me. Right? You ease God out. You ease God out, and the moment you've done that, you have become self-deceived because now you have replaced him. It has to. You have to replace God. Somebody has to be in charge. Do you think it's possible to do anything without faith? Ask yourself this question. If time allowed, I would make you take out a piece of paper and write down yes or no so you could prove it to yourself that your answer was true. So when you see you're wrong, you're wrong. You don't just change it. Then you'll be more determined to learn what's right. If your faith is wrong, it doesn't matter what you got right. You're wrong. If you get Jesus wrong, it doesn't matter what you got right. You're wrong. All you have is being religious. Because then Jesus is your co-pilot. You ever seen a bumper sticker in front of you? Jesus is my co-pilot. You should see the other bumper sticker on the front of the car. Here comes a fool. Man, I just made that up. <laughs> but it sounds right. <laughs> I make up most everything. I don't study for this. I the Bible says I'm supposed to study to show myself approved unto God, not to you. You should be spending every day, at some point of the day, every day, at some point of the day, every day, at some point of the day, and then, if you time allows, every day at some point of the day, you need to feed on the Word of God. You feed on His oxygen. You feed on His food. You feed on social relationships. Lord knows how much you must feed on social media. But are you feeding in the Word? And if you are, how do you know it's truth? What, just because it was in this? How do you know you're right? I said to Papa the other day on the phone, we were laughing and giggling about the guy who says, I'm going to obey God. Jesus went and crucified himself. I didn't want to do it. Let's do it again. Go and do likewise. That is not how you spend time in the Word. When was the last time you were broken bread and poured out wine? You know, this is something you should ask yourself. When have I been broken? When have I poured myself out? If you're not, if you can't even answer those kinds of questions, whatever else you've been complaining about, it's out of order. We always tend to get our priorities a little mixed up, and this is what James is telling us. So if today we had to have a topic for this message, I think the topic would be, oh, I'm so dangerous saying things like this. Get your faith right. Or you're wrong. I guess that'll work, uh, Isaiah. I said it right, didn't I? Elijah changed it again on me. Stop changing your name. 
Elisha, Elisha, Elisha. Get your, fight, get your faith right or you're wrong. So we're going to pick up our scripture where we are from where we left off. We left off at, um, for verse 6. But, so we'll run, we'll run through it in 5. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives it liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. We covered that all in our last time together. I told you the last time I taught the book of James, it took about a year or so. When I preach every month or every other month, it'll take five years. But let him ask in faith with no doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. But let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all of his and her ways. Father God, we commit this time to you in the name of Jesus. Thank you for the beautiful families that are here, the saints that love you, those who don't know you as we do. We pray you are catching their heart today. And let this word touch us, Father, in a most unique and special way that it is unique and clear for every one of us in our own precious need in our relationship with you. And we we thank you. Thank you for the thank you for the food of your word, Father. Thank you so much. Thank you for the living word that lives through us and in us. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 But let him ask in faith. The term in faith is very unique. You've heard of the term in Christ, in faith, in trouble. The point of what is being said here by Jesus' half-brother is to be consumed. So what I want you to do is just picture a giant, uh, beautiful cruise ship on top of the ocean, okay? Um, this ma the majesty of this floating city, everybody knows if you've ever been on one. It's a remarkable thing, especially if you're on a big one. It's, an, it's grand, right? Now, close your eyes, everyone. That ship has sunk. Picture it at the bottom of the water, three miles deep. Picture how quiet it is down there. The stillness, not a sound. There is life there, but good luck seeing it without proper light. Even to be that deep, the pressure is unbearable for humanity to survive it. Now you get the picture. What has happened to this ship? I want you to picture every, every cabin is now full of water. Every hallway is full of water. The chow halls, the show theaters, the specialty stores, even the bathrooms. Everything is soaked. Every nook and cranny, every crevice, every crack is now filled and consumed. Technically, we can now say that the water is in the ship. Or technically, we could say the ship is in the water. You're incapable of distinguishing the two. They are completely intertwined one into the other. Do you see this now? There's no more air bubbles. This is, this is over this much time, it's consumed. And you've all seen some relical picture of what the Titanic looks like under the water. So you can imagine over time what's happening. The occasional drift of a grain of sand. And then another and another and eventually in a barnacle or two. And another and another. And the rust and another and another. Until it's consumed. The ship is in the ocean. The ocean is in the ship. Are you in Christ? Getting in. Are you 
in faith. Because if your faith is wrong, it doesn't matter what else you got right, you're wrong. It's that big of a deal. If your faith is wrong, it doesn't matter what you got right, you're wrong. Because if you get Jesus wrong, it doesn't matter what you got right, you're wrong. And if your faith in Christ is wrong, everything you do is just at best morally religious. Human Christianism, Christian humanism, whichever one you want to pretend matters first most. The bottom line is you have become nothing more than a key member of the 4P club. Now you are nothing more than a pretender, a performer, a persecutor, or a powder. You know, brother, you came up here with a little word from the Lord, which was powerful. And you know where you got that from? I will tell you where that came from. The Lord speaking to you last night. That's what Mama talked about just a few weeks ago. That was her whole message. How do we live holy in a very unholy world? Do it right on, spot on. So validation. But nothing is worse than wrong faith that you validate yourself and create self-deception, and now you're stuck. And then I can bring everybody to the present state of life with that basic introduction I just gave you. I just gave you a few moments to reflect on it because you all know how you got yourself into the situation you're in right now. Some of you don't know. Some of you think it was done to you. Somebody, some of you think it just happens to you because this is my health, my family, my, my, my health history, my family's history, or whatever you want to call it. You are where you are today because of every decision you made yesterday. And you were where you were yesterday because of the decisions you made the day before. I told you last time I preached, last time I talked about offerings, last time I had any moment I get to share with you, which weeks ago, prepare your offering on Saturday night, Friday night, and be so excited about you can't wait till Sunday, you can't get it off your mind. If you don't do that, you can't understand what I shared with you. God never... God didn't give them an advance notice. Don't worry, I'll part the Red Sea. I'll meet you when you get there. God doesn't tell you in advance when you're going to get blessed. You just by faith believe the praises go up, the blessings come down. Is your life a life of living praise? Can you shut your mouth and people can tell just by looking at you, you must be a Christian? Is there enough evidence in your life that if you were dragged into a court to be persecuted and put to death for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to prove you're guilty? It says in Romans chapter 14 and verse 23, it's the very last line in the, in the chapter, it says... For without faith, anything done without faith is sin. For apart from faith, you have sinned. Anything done apart from faith is sin. I'm giving you a bunch of translations. So if you would find out that anything done apart from faith is sin, you would deduce as an intelligent adult, oh, that must mean I can do something apart from faith. Because if I do that, it must be sin. See? And I asked you only a few moments ago, do you think it's possible to do something apart from faith? No. There's nothing you can do. You breathe by faith. You go to sleep at night and assume your heart's going to keep beating by faith. You sat in a chair today believing by faith. It was sitting there on holding you. You can do nothing apart from faith. So is your faith right or wrong? If your faith is wrong, how many things are you doing all the time apart from the right faith? How wrong are you? And you come in here, what do you expect? To get fixed? You know, slap a tag on and go? I mean, what are you getting? Holy hug? That doesn't get it right. 
And you can't rub up against somebody who's got their faith right, and you get it right. Pastor Mars stood up here for the last few times. He swung an axe. The head flew off. Don't lose your head. The next thing you know, he's dropping the pot. Lose your head. Get rid of all that clutter and garbage that's just consuming you. Has anybody even thought about, even for a moment, even these messages? Do you go home at any point during the week and go back over the lesson and begin to outline it? Pause it. Go back. What did he say? Pause that. Now go check that. Is that really in the Bible? Is that not in the Bible? Where is that in the Bible? How many times is that in the Bible? Do you study to prove to show yourself approved? Or do you just believe everybody that walks up here must be right because they say it with so much conviction? They got to be right. I mean, pastor know it all, and doctor, I got it right, and bishop, don't ask me. Reverend, don't tell me. And the lists go on and on, and everybody's titles and positions and places. And half the people in the church don't know half the facts of what's even going on because you don't even check. When was the last time you walked in the office and said, uh, Sister Janice, how was the offering last week? How much did we get? Were we over budget or under budget? What, are you afraid you might get moved to have to do something with your money in that account you sit that does nothing and you never touch? What do you think it's sitting there for? What's it sitting there for? So you can have peace of mind? Christ gives us peace of mind, not your bank. But let him ask in. Now, in your Bible, I would give you permission to write, because I write in my Bible a ton. Tons. I give you permission to write, but let him or... Now, you see the word him? Now I'm going to lead by example. Who gave a dollar? you got to be kidding. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> I'm looking for a pen. Okay. Here's what you're going to write, because you got the pen you're not giving me. But let Dominic ask in faith. Write your name there in the Bible. Make that Bible yours that God wrote to you. This is his I love you letter to you. So start writing. You go through my Bible, you'll find my name written in there 500 times, if not 1,000. Everywhere I can write my name instead of the him or the her or the them, I write my name. Because then you know he's talking to me. So I let Dominic ask in, and then you can, write, you can write an amplified word in your Bible. Here's an amplified word. That means you could put it in there. It resembles truth, but you added it. Let him ask in right faith, correct faith. Put the word right or correct right there to remind you every time. Every, every time I've been teaching this, I told you, Go through chapter 1, study it again. Go through chapter 1, study it again. Keep finding more things, because you don't know what I'm going to bring up. You might go, oh, oh, I found that too. Great. If you can't share that, sorry you didn't study. And maybe you found something I haven't picked up on yet. You can go, I noticed this. Hey, you're right, that's a good point. I didn't think of that. Or, yeah, I knew that, but it wouldn't, it, there wasn't time. You could learn about a whole new level of getting excited you're not familiar with. Getting excited about when the word becomes, repeat this after me, a rhema. Rhema. Say it. Everyone say rhema. Good. And that's different than logos. Logos, this is the logos of God, the full expression of God's entire, this is the logos. This is the living Right? This is the living word of God. Right? Christ is the living Logos. In the beginning was the Logos, and the Logos was with God, and the Logos was God. And nothing was created except the Logos made it. But Rhema is a word that becomes directly and intentionally meant to you. Like Jesus said to Peter, come, when he wanted to step out of the boat too. That was a rhema word to Peter. Not to the three little girls who drowned in Watchman Nee's book because they thought 
By faith, we could walk across the river with the raging current, and if we have the faith of a mustard seed, we'll make it to the other side. And they found them a few miles down, washed up, dead, drowned. Um, when God gives you a rhema, it's for you. Good luck sharing it with someone. Haven't you ever walked up to somebody and go, oh, man, you can't believe what I just found in the Word. I was looking at the Word last night. You can't believe. I started writing this. I started that. I can't believe. I can't. And, and then you ever have somebody come to you like that? Or you went to somebody like that? Have you? Oh, you can't believe what God showed me. And then they're, they're, they're like, they're looking at you like a calf looking at a new gate. You're like, don't you? Don't you? No. To them, all you're describing is a logos. To you, it was a rhema. So stop trying to share your rhemas. Live them. Share the logos and give God the freedom to fill in the rhema in other people's lives. Because why? Because you teach them how to walk in right faith. So let's get to it in a couple of minutes and I'm going to wrap. Here comes the close. Every blessing you have comes from the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, good. I got a nice amen. Let's see if the next amen is just as thorough. The cross was the means that Jesus used for every blessing to come to you. Good. Now you're getting it. Therefore, the cross becomes the object of your faith. Amen. Not the wooden beam that Jesus hung on, not, not this, what he accomplished on the cross when he said, it is finished. It is finished. John 19.30, what is finished? What do you need? It's finished. What do you think? They just didn't have another word to throw in there? It's like uh, mostly done, uh, got a good head start, got you on a roll. It's done. It's finished. That means it's finished. Don't try to help adding any more to it. We don't need to be reimagined. We don't need to be fluffed up. We don't need to be turned into a new version. We don't need to be the new model. It is finished. And Jesus Christ, Hebrews 13, 8, is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So what part of that needs you to come along and modify it? What part of that needs to be, you know, sparked up here with a few handfuls of angel gold and angel dust and angel wings and all that? By the way, you can't find anywhere in the Bible that angels have wings. They do not. They're in male figure, not female. They're in adult form, not kid form. They don't have wings. They don't fly like that. Don't tell me you heard the brush of angels' wings. You have no idea how many songs we sing that are not doctrinally true. Go study and you'll find out. I'm not going to tell them to you. You'll notice most of the time if I'm just sitting there. But when you're worshiping and it's true, I'm in there. And you need to know that because otherwise you will accept counterfeit money, you will accept counterfeit truth, and you won't know because you don't know what real faith is. So in the presence of truth, even you can get fooled. But for you, it should be in the presence of truth. The lie is always evident. Nothing fools you. Nothing. No one, no thing out of a dead sleep, you could tell. Lie. Going back to sleep. That's simple. So number one, every blessing comes from Jesus Christ. Number two, the cross is the means. Number three, therefore, the cross of Christ should become the object of your faith. Not the person of your faith. That's Christ and him crucified. That's why Paul said, I'm determined to know nothing among you but Christ and him crucified. He said it enough. He said, I didn't come to baptize. I came to preach the gospel, not with words of wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be made of none effect. How do you make the cross of Christ of none effect? Have the wrong faith. All you need is the wrong faith and you have just taken. It is finished too. It was a waste of time. Yes, exactly. 
Ah, my family. And when you make the cross of Christ the object of your faith, then finally, point number four. Then and only then will the moving and operation power of the Holy Spirit begin to work in you, through you, for you, with who, for you, why you, with you, in you, through you, and make it happen, whatever it is that you think you're giving God his choice to do for you. If, in fact, you don't get this very last point I'm going to make, everything I just said was, well, at least I hope I entertained you. It's this fact. And this is big enough to make the cover of your Bible. And when I use that term, I mean it seriously. Because when Papa and many others say something that's worth making the cover of the Bible, it makes the cover of the Bible. And when it's that good, it makes the cover of the Bible. And when it's that good, it makes the cover of the Bible. And when you run out of covers in the Bible, you go to the back of the Bible, and that was good, it makes the cover of the Bible. And that was good, it makes the cover of the Bible. Because you, if it makes the cover of the Bible, will never forget what made the cover of your Bible. So I'm about to give you a cover of your Bible statement, so get this. And then the worshipers can come up. But get this first. The moving and operating power of the Holy Spirit only works within the parameters of the finished work of the cross if your faith is in the finished work of the cross as the exclusive object of your faith. And if you don't get that right, you're wrong. You could be as holy and as reverent as... Listen, don't forget, Mary, the mother of Christ Jesus, not the mother of God, get that right. That's how Catholicism has gotten out to lunch. Mary had to get saved just like you and me. She had four boys and at least two daughters after Jesus was born. They weren't immaculate conceptions. There was Mary and Joseph making love, and it was the real deal. And the seed of Adam in the Mary, yada, yada, born in sin, must get saved. Shouldn't surprise anybody. But if you're going to start praying things like Holy Mary, Mother of God, you're out to lunch. And I don't know where you went out to lunch because they don't even serve food there. You are definitely sitting on a rock somewhere. And not on the rock like I sit on. Because the rock I sit and stand on is the one where my name is on the roll. That's why I like rock and roll. Okay, now you understand that. (laughs) If your faith is in the finished work of the cross of Christ and you remain exclusively with your faith in the cross of Christ, then the moving and operating power of the Holy Spirit will move and operate in your life because God will have his way because all you know is, I trust you, Father, because my faith is in the finished work of Christ regarding that. I trust you, Father, because my work is in the finished work in the finished work of the cross regarding that person. I trust you, Father, for this job because in the cross, Jesus said, my job is finished. I trust you, Father, for this car that won't seem to start because in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, it is finished. My car works. If it doesn't now, it's due to because I trust it was finished for me. If you put your faith in the finished work of the cross, the moving and operating power of the Holy Spirit will activate, and when it does, it will move on behalf of the will of God. And when he gives you the desire of your heart, that's because your heart desire is only what is God's heart desire, which is like David was only his desire was for the heart of God, right? So you desire the heart things of God. God gives you the desire of your heart because they're all his heart. Because of the finished work, it is finished. Then the Holy Spirit is moving. Because the minute you change the object of your faith to anything outside the cross, and it's not, I trust you in the cross, Father, for this, I trust you, the Holy Spirit's just going to do this. And now you're down to a Galatians 2. And yes, you could pray you don't want to grieve the Holy Spirit, but you did anyway. How? By changing the object of your faith. 
by changing the object of your faith, 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 you cancel. You say, but, but, but God blessed me. No, 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 no. Don't you dare give God the credit for what you're capable of doing in the flesh, in the carnal, that the world will believe you because you were convincing and you got your way. You got the job. God didn't give you that job. You made that money. God didn't give you that money. Yeah, but all the gold and all the silver is mine. Say, yeah, yeah, but this is the thing. You're not in the will of the moving and operating power of the Holy Spirit because the cross of Christ is the exclusive object of your faith because you know your blessings come through the cross, which was the means that Jesus used because all blessings come from Christ. And because they come from him, the cross he used as the means because the cross is the object of your faith, the Holy Spirit moved on your behalf and it all happened. Get your faith right or you're wrong. Nothing else Nothing else. If you get Jesus wrong, whatever you got right is still wrong. I love you, family. I love you. Love you. Here's the altar call. Here's the altar call. And then these beautiful musicians, ladies, I love you. All musicians. Even the voice. <laughs> I forgot to tell you, turn your phones off so they don't disturb us. <laughs> Voices are instruments. While they sing this song, you sit there and you answer this question. If I die tonight, if I die today, if I don't make it to tomorrow morning, and I'm standing in front of God, or not standing in front of God, I'm not sure, but right now while I'm sitting here, I know that I know that I know I'll be absent from the body and in the presence of my Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to heaven. You either absolutely know that like that or you're not saved. You may be a backslider. Yeah, you love God. You believe in Jesus. You prayed the prayer, walked the aisle, got dunked in the tank, whatever. You gave your dollar. Your relationship with Jesus is just, oh boy, I would pray you never get on the other side of that relationship and you get God to treat you that bad, that empty, that weak, that meaningless. And maybe you need to come on home. Come on home. Come on home. And rekindle that marriage. Rekindle that life of love with your first true love. And for all the rest of you who are just skating along because you got God right, check your faith. If the cross is not the exclusive object of your faith, you're wrong. And the next time you yell at somebody on the freeway or get upset about a bill you don't have enough money for, or the next time you didn't have the leftover pizza you thought was there and somebody else had it before you, or whatever silly or important thing matters, and you get your knickers in a bunch, you heard me. Panties in a wad for those of you who didn't get it. You get yourself ruffled like that. You just change the object of your faith from Jesus Christ and Him crucified to whatever you're whining about, and that's how easy it is to change the object of your faith. Instead of assigning it to it was finished and why, and you walk in that glory and that presence and then deal with the garbage you're dealing with, and the Holy, you're there alone. The Holy Spirit's not even with you in that mess. But you assign it to the finished work of the cross, and no matter whether you're even going to go through a life sentence like Joseph, he served life. Because 25 years is life. Would you be willing to get thrown in a pit 25 years later to come out leading Egypt? Would you be willing to pay that price? You would if the cross of Christ is the exclusive object of your faith. Because you would have did those 25 in a week. And you would have did that week in a blink. 
I love you so much.